Jabba bids you welcome. The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's the church planner's excuse for everything. Don't let El Nino catch you by surprise. Make sure that you get PortableChurch.com. I knew you were going there. I knew it. (laughs) You can't just blame El Nino for everything. Sometimes you need to blame yourself. You're stupid because you didn't get SimplifyChurch.com to meet all your... Oh, wait, wait, wrong commercial. (laughs) PortableChurchIndustries.com. Portable Church will help you pack and unpack your church, even in the midst of a hurricane like El Nino. El Nino. You got to say it like that. Oh, El Nino. (laughs) Go to PortableChurch.com and find out how you, too, can be ready for El Nino. (laughs) People have no idea what Portable Church is. Uh, It's basically this thing that makes your church portable. Um, They have equipment. For churches that have to set up and tear down. But that was seriously like an epic. Like, I wish I was dressed in a luchador costume when I did that. Pe- people don't remember. Pe- oh, welcome to the Church Planner Podcast, by the way. That was our – Pete and I were busting each other up before we got on here, so we decided to start. But uh, you guys don't remember. The younger generation doesn't remember that there was a period. I would say almost a five-year period of time in America – where El Nino was blamed for everything. And I mean, I, sorry I'm late. Bad traffic, El Nino. <laughs> and, it, and it almost wasn't a joke. It was oh, like, it's so oh, true. your package didn't come. Uh, you called the company. Where's my package? Oh, sorry, we're being held up by mm. El Nino. El Nino. El Nino. Yeah. It was, it was like the thing, you know? The child. Yeah, it was bad <laughs> stuff. It was bad. The news. little boy. I know Spanish. But people don't even know what El Nino was. It was a hurricane. And now they're like, La Nina! La Nina! This generation's like, hurricanes, we get those all the time. It's no big deal now. I mean, there there's a lot of hurricanes. Well, now they the just flat blame... Earth people are going nuts over this. The, the, now they're just blaming the, uh, the climate change, as if that exists, you people. <laughs> Normally, flat Earth people don't like the idea of climate change. I'm just saying... I'm just saying that, you know, I don't believe that the earth is round and I don't believe that climate is changing. Did you play that clip by any chance or did you save it from the Bible inner circle? What? Where the guy was talking about, he listens to it with his 12 year old. (laughs) Oh my gosh, dude. Oh my gosh. So Aaron Bump, I didn't, I didn't save it, but I got to tell everyone. Aaron Bump is in the Voxer and he just listened to the Church Planner podcast and he's like, yeah, you know what? Uh, when I'm driving my 12 year old to school, we listen to the first half on the way there and the second half on the way back. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's helping me have these conversations with my son. And he says, dad is, is the first half of this just like some comedy skit? <laughs> And to which all I could reply in the Voxer group was, you let your 12-year-old listen to our podcast? Do you not have a soul? <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah. My uh, my wife, who was on the podcast uh, this week, actually doesn't listen to the podcast anymore. It was all those clips we were playing from films that were, in her opinion, inappropriate, like What's in the box? She you know what? I was just thinking, I don't have that as a sound clip. I'm glad you didn't play it when she was on. She would have like, turned and ran. I want it as a sound clip. Yeah. You don't have that anymore? I don't think I ever did. Like, John Doe has the upper hand. <laughs> Aboard the mission. Oh, wait. I did. I remember those. Remember, you used to play that all the time. Yeah, I don't have them. Ever since, uh, what I do? I got like a new computer or something? I, I can't remember you exactly. You did. You wiped out our old soundboard. 
Yeah. I remember that. I remember the soundboard was gone. I just didn't remember why. Yeah. The old soundboard was good. I yeah. enjoyed it. So I had a funny experience. So I was in Denver opening up this uh, church planning training center, and we had a guy. We had people from <laughs> all different walks of life, man. One guy was uh, he was from Venezuela, and uh, we were having tacos over, um, you know, lunch one day, and uh, they just happened to bring in fajitas tacos, and he was like, you know, people think like because you're from a Hispanic speaking country, we're all the same. He's like. I never ate hot sauce till I moved to Colorado. I never ate. Wait, wait, wait. That's a that's a line that's never been said before ever by a Mexican. Say that again. Yeah, well, he wasn't a Mexican. He's from Venezuela. Oh, and he's like, same thing, he's right? like people think we're all wait, the same. Wait, wait, so wait, wait, wait. Did you just hear that? Come on, that was so bad. Yeah. I have to cut it out. That's how bad that comment was. <laughs> yeah, I basically said same thing. Venezuela, Mexico, same well, thing. That, that's what he's saying. And so he was talking about how he's had to become all things to all men. I'm not cutting and it. You're not cutting it? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, it, it, so we, you know, it was funny. The, the hot sauce that they delivered us for our training was called burning butt sauce. Ooh. It was it was a prophetic hot sauce for sure. And uh, But he was saying, I've never had this before. But, um, you know, of course, I'm I'm giving him a hard time the whole whole time we're there. Like when I say goodbye to him, I said, hey, buenos nachos, you know. Uh, it was a very warm farewell, and I just decided to blow it with my sense of humor. And uh, he gave me this really weird look, like his head tilted to the side, kind of like a dog, like he was trying to figure out, what did you just say? And, of course, I'm doing it tongue-in-cheek, like knowing as I'm walking out the door like I'm an idiot. And uh, and then I saw this smile break out on his face because he was he was pretty funny dude. And um, But it, at a certain point, we were talking, he, I mentioned Nacho Libre, as I would. And, uh, he, he said, he said, yeah, you know, uh, we had this American pastor and, you know, he came to our fellowship and he was talking about, you know, how he was, you know, uh, he was using Spanish words and he mentioned that he would, would, you know, he, he mentioned how he would call his son Chancho and you've seen the movie, right? Yeah. But I, I didn't get into it like you and Charlie did by any means. Oh my gosh. It is such a guy. If you don't know Nacho Libre, it's just it's comedic gold. But he said, you know, we had to tell him, oh, no, no, because every time he would throw out that word chancho, our, our congregation would wince. And he said, but why? Why? You know, finally, they told him, they said, look, man, you got to understand that whole term in the movie was a joke. Chancho means fat, sweaty pig. And that's what he's calling that little kid in the orphanage, his fat, greasy pig. And he's like, so, you know, so I got a new appreciation for Nacho Libre. I learn things. Don't say Peyton Jones never learns things. I do. Peyton Jones always learns things. How's that? Is that better? That would be a much better thing for everyone to tweet right now. <laughs> just stop what you're doing on this podcast. and just tweet. Uh, okay. Peyton Jones always learns things. Hey, you said that something happened to you the other day that you wanted to tell me about. Yeah, but, you know, I forgot about it. Oh, you know what, dude? I never hit record. Oh, well, let's start over. Oh, no, wait. That's no. probably best. No, I did. False alarm. False alarm. We're good. We're good. I'm telling you, man, our podcast, half the time, if we didn't record and we got to do it over, that's probably a blessing in disguise. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know I forgot that. You were like, I can't tell you now. I have to save it for the podcast. There was something that happened. Oh. Like you went to you a musical? Remember? Was it the musical? Was it something about that? Oh my gosh, that was it! Oh my gosh! So I go to this musical. It it okay. This is what it is on the ticket because I bought this season pass for Andrew. She likes to go down to San Diego, be taken on a fancy pants date. So I got to wear like long pants and close toed shoes. It's kind of a big deal. Got to wear a shirt with a collar on it. So I take her out, you know, about once a month you know, to something like that. So if I buy a season pass, the, those are those dates like sorted. So I take her down to San Diego and the, the name of the show on the ticket is called the heart of rock and roll. Now, when I called up and I bought the season pass, they're like, Oh yeah, you know, it's like a Broadway show. It's a uh, heart of rock and roll. It's a uh, musical to the music of Huey Lewis. What could go wrong? Right? Well, it's Except a musical that right off the bat should tell you something. 
uh, pretty much. But if you're going to go see a musical, go see it with an 80s rock band attached to it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I go and, and, and we sit there and I can tell from the first song, this is not going to go well. Just the way they played the very first one, it was not going to go well at all. And uh, so we, we, we get in there and we sit down, we watch a show. And I pretty much look at Andrea about, you know, the, the intermission lights come up. And I'm like, I can't sit through another hour of that. I don't know about you. And she goes, no, definitely not. So we just we skedaddled out of there, man. But how do you mess up Huey Lewis music? I mean, Heart of Rock and Roll itself, which they did play, which was like a neutered version of itself, which I think we already mentioned that that show, The Good Place, where Ted Danson brings up this this truth, this universal truth, how it's very human to take something good and basically re-engineer it into a crappier version of itself. Um, Do you was, watch you know, that show? Oh, my gosh, dude. That show was so funny. We literally started watching it the other day on Netflix. And Jamie and I both were like, eh, I don't know if I can keep watching this because it just was so stupid. That's why I like it. <laughs> yeah. So he makes he makes that point And he, he basically is saying like ice cream to frozen yogurt. You know, that's what we do. And that is what we do. We take we take something good that God made and we we crapify it. But that's what happened to this wait, guy's wait, wait, wait. music. Are you saying you don't like frozen yogurt? Oh, dude. How how does anyone like frozen yogurt? I cannot believe the more we get to know each other, the more I come to realize we really have like nothing in common. How you are like we frozen even friends? Yogurt? On that show, we in are heaven. literally Star Wars friends only. There is like nothing else about the two of us that is in any way in common with the other. That's what Jesus does, Pete. He brings completely opposite people together. I'm just saying, man. I I I am learning something new about. What I'm just going to refer to as the other side every time I talk to you. Man, I'm telling you, we are a walking, talking miracle, you and I. A I, two-headed walking, I don't know that it's a good monster. miracle, but it's a miracle. No. no. I, I tell you what, man. There's a place by us in Encinitas that it's called Handles. It makes the best ice cream I've ever tasted in my life. And I have been in Britain. I have had some great ice cream. Like... There's like ice cream that comes straight out of a cow's udder. I mean, it's 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 heaven kissed. These are holy cows. So that's I have like, had amazing that's like, ice cream. Since this, cows are 103 degrees on average, that's 103 degree ice cream. That's <laughs> straight. Mm, I don't know about that. How did you know the temperature of a cow? Actually, I just made it up. But you know, that was pretty good. If you I want to believe that I know. You know, I was, you know me, I'm a little gullible. <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, you know, anyways, that's what they did. You know, when you listen to Heart of Rock and Roll, one of the coolest things about it is that honky-tonk harmonica on it. There was no honky-tonk harmonica. And I need to feel like I'm in a trucker bar when I'm listening to that song, you know? I need to feel like every time he says something like D.C., Austin, San Antonio, I need to feel like I'm punched in the face. You that's know, how Huey Lewis delivers that song. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I, things are now rolling back in my head, and I'm like, okay. We really don't have anything in common. As a, as a great example, on, there's no way I would ever go to a musical. Like, I wouldn't buy, I don't care how much my wife is like, you need to take me somewhere. I'm not going to a musical. I just, I would be like, no, this isn't happening. Hey, dude, you know what? Like, musicals and me don't get along. We have that in common. If you said you would go to a music, Musical, she might as well be speaking Chinese in response Look, because it would be like a whole other universe. I really wish we hadn't recorded this podcast because it started out going down and it has not, you know, normally it's like a plane that's like going down. No, wait, there it goes and it takes off again. We haven't done the little and gone back up. I'm throwing that I'm out there. I'm just saying like, hey, you could get me to a Led Zeppelin musical. You couldn't, you wouldn't go to, what if, okay. You're let me still ask you hooked this. What if it was on the musical. Notorious B.I.G. The musical. You wouldn't go? No. Come on. You got to go to those. I, have you not listened to our early podcast when I told you literally how many songs I owned in my entire album collection? How many? It was like 96, of which 25 of them were the Mortal Kombat soundtrack. Are you serious? Yes. I don't Finish remember him. <laughs> Finish him. Finish <laughs> him. 
<laughs> it's a great, yeah, it's a great techno soundtrack. <laughs> oh, it is, it is. I remember that movie. That was that was the a original. Pretty bad movie, but the song was rad. Oh, I loved it. I bought it. Yeah. Mortal Kombat. Oh, I remember that. Liu Kang. <laughs> that was Rated. a weird movie. I tell you, along those lines, Johnny what Cage. was a rad movie <laughs> that that kind of is like that movie. Do you remember Big Trouble in Little China? Oh, do I? Come on. We're that's back, like, baby. That's We're one of the back. greatest Come movies on. ever. Oh, we've got friendship again. We do. I knew it wouldn't take much to restore that. She's got green eyes. She's got green eyes. Oh, my gosh, dude. I saw that movie in the theater, and I was like, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen. When that dude blows up and his head explodes. Oh! Come on. The, the the Raiden appearing in the alleyway with all the lightning. Oh, it's good stuff, Dude, man. I'm telling you, that that was a great movie. You've that redeemed yourself. Movie. Just when I think you can't do anything any stupider, you totally go out and redeem yourself. <laughs> yeah, it was stupid, and I do repent of seeing the Huey Lewis musical. It was pretty bad. So, you know, it's funny, man, because the last time that I went there and the show was really bad, I fell asleep. Now, when you're in a, the theater, you know, and you're you're like dressed kind of nice, you know, it's it's one thing to fall asleep. It's really bad if you're in Othello and you snore because that's pretty much what happened. That's the last time I had to leave halfway through. I actually was because I was there. Story. Yeah. And I <laughs> during Othello. And I kept waking up, and everyone's looking at me. So finally, I looked at Andrea. About the fifth, sixth snore fest interrupted by people rudely looking at me, and I had to say, "Let's go." So uh, <clears throat> on to on to more important topics. How about that, Brett Kavanaugh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, man. You know, it's funny you mention this because I don't know. I haven't really been following it very much. But what did come up on my feed the other day? was the um, Judge Clarence Thomas hearing. And I remember that. I watched that, and I followed that way back. Really? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I I mean, I remember it all happening in Anita Hill and all that, but I, you know, I didn't really follow it. And You go back and you watch it, and you can see a man that's holding back his anger because he's been falsely accused. Oh, really? You think so? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when when you watch all that, um, you know somebody somebody was definitely lying. But there's there's a look a guy gets, and and for him it was more about at a certain point he said, look, um, and and I wondered when I was listening to him because he was he was speaking very clearly. He was angry. He said to the committee, look, um, if I had done these things, this could have been a a, a back room investigation. He's like, I emphatically declare to you, I did not do these things. But he goes, but you, he goes, I'm not here for the nomination anymore. He goes, that, that's behind me. He goes, I'm here to clear my name. I'm here because I have a family and I have a life and I have my own integrity. And he said, I'm here to vindicate my name, which you have ruined. And he said, and to be honest, he goes, none of you on this committee you could have done this investigation without running to the media and trashing me because he says once it got to that level, he goes, there was nothing I could do. And he said, none of you would like to be treated this way. And he goes, and this was for a political gain that you and he's looking at the committee he says members of this committee have done this specifically to advance a political agenda. You've destroyed a man. And he says, and I got to tell you, in a country like America, that should not be the case. And then he goes on to say, and I'll tell you lastly, as a black man in America, this feels to me like a high tech lynching. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was just taken out and lynched, you know, and, wow. and, and you, you look back on that and you, you know, I, like I said, I haven't been following the current, uh, Kavana case, but I can just tell you, you know, I see, I see it come up in my newsfeed and. I so distrust the media now that I don't know what to believe. And he even, he even makes the point that um, he said that, that the media found that many of these things were not accurate. Many of these claims were not accurate. And yet the damage was already done. He brings that point yeah. up. 
And, and I think in, in our culture, what we have to be careful of right now is the fact that we have people that right now it's a, it's a hot topic to make an accusation and you are guilty when the act, that's why the, yeah. the constitution says you're innocent until proven guilty. And that's not how it works in the realm of public opinion, unfortunately. No. no. So if this guy's innocent, um, I just, I find it so hypocritical that, that the, the people on the left, the, the first to cry out Pharisee and why are you judging and this and that are right now looking at what a dude did in high school, albeit if it was, if it was rape, it was rape. You know, I, like I said, well, I haven't he wasn't following. even accused of that. Right. But here's a guy that's drinking too much and I'm thinking, you guys right now in office are doing far worse. Yeah. But it's, it's just when it gets yeah. political, it just feels so, um, I don't know. It's just hard for me to, to, I, it's hard for me to respond to it. It's hard for me to get involved because I realize there's such an agenda that, you know, even, even if someone's like, well, wait a second, man, what if I'm not, I'm not making a stance here because I don't know if he's guilty of assaulting females, then, you know, yeah, of course you don't want a guy with no character on the judicial Supreme court. Um, and we also don't want them in Congress. Ab- ab- exactly. Or we don't want them. <laughs> we don't want them as, as a pastors president. in our churches. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I agree. It matters. If you understand the biblical definition of leadership, whether it was from, you know, the position of kings to the position of a spiritual leader, character is extreme. You cannot read the Bible and come away with the fact that character is not important to leadership. Yeah, and I, think, I think one of the things that you said that I, I wholeheartedly agree with is I, I have not been following it because, it, and we've said this before, I mean, Trump... <laughs> is not my guy. It's not like I'm, I'm like, Oh yeah, Trump. And I, I wasn't, you know, a Hillary supporter. I, I, I don't like either one of these, these, the, the two people who ran for president. Um, and I don't really, I don't know anything about the dude. I haven't followed any of it. Cause I kind of don't, I mean, I care and I don't care. I don't care in the sense that I, I really you know, as as uh, a former guest of ours who's been on this this podcast before, um, on his Facebook, he's always writing great stuff, and he's always going after basically both sides. I believe the guy is a prophet; like he's got that kind of uh, 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 persona to him. But he just always says, "Always, it's like I've been saying, it's all over but the screaming." And I just look at America today, and I'm like, "Yeah." Unfortunately, it's all over but the screaming. And it's yeah. like, okay, you know, if this guy makes it through, I don't know if that's good or bad because I don't I don't trust the man who nominated him. I don't know anything about the guy. You can't believe anything that the media says on either side. I don't believe right. Fox News any more than I believe CNN. Right. It's like I, I don't I don't I have no idea. All I know is it's all over but the screaming, man. It's just like Wow, I can't I can't believe what's happening. That's it, man. And here's the thing is I always when I look at the the battle that we've got in America, the battle to get a Republican in is not the battle of the kingdom of God. The battle of the kingdom of God is the battle for integrity. And I think what's happened right now in America is that the 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 Christian right wing has sacrificed integrity to support a Republican. Yeah. And it's completely under undermined its own platform yeah. more so than it was before. Because every time we see like do you remember like um you know, years ago the guy that was the he was the leader of the right wing conservative movement, he was caught up in a scandal. You know, here he was banging the drum on morality. And he was caught up in a, in a scandal. And then you, you've had countless other leaders who were like the moral right, moral majority, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden they're caught up in some scandal. So we were undermined before, but now to watch everybody do an about face and support a man without clearly without Christian character, um, or, or the integrity that you would expect out of your pastor. 
more or less the leader of the free world. Well, um, come on. He's a baby Christian. It's not his fault. Right. I is, mean, th- have you noticed that's like that always... everyone's that's that's everyone's excuse. Oh, well, he's just a baby Christian. He's brand new. I would have said about Obama that he was a bad leader, but he presented himself as a man of integrity. He presented himself as faithful to his wife, a good father, a man who stuck to his principles, even if you didn't agree with those principles. Um, there, there seemed to be more integrity in Barack Obama than there did in Donald Trump. I, in some respects, clearly. Yeah. Um, but in other respects, I'm not, I'm I would not say, an Obama fan yeah, any more yeah, than I'm a Trump fan. But I would, I would say in other respects, he was very much uh, a dictator and how he decided to handle he was. things. I agree with that. I agree with that. I actually feel that many of our freedoms in both of these presidents, I think we're, we're coming into an era of the presidency where people are taking what they've gotten from, you know, the business world and applying it to the presidency and not understanding that we are a constitutional republic. We're not even a democracy. People don't understand. Well, we were, it's not the majority. We were a constitutional republic. I don't know that we still are anymore, unfortunately. Well, correct. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying is is the ignorance of the American people is just staggering right yeah. now. That people would go along with um, so many things that, you know, like, like for example, um, you know, socialism. We, at the last election... We were very close to seeing the return of socialism, which, if you remember, um, I I think I mentioned this from Jordan Peterson, how, you know, his his main thing right now is he brings up that ideologies are very dangerous because if you look at the 20th century in particular, you see that millions of people were slaughtered in the name of ideology Uh, or socialism, the benefit, the betterment of all mankind, fair and equal and it, people were slaughtered over that. There was a bloodbath over we will force you to to accept what we're going to do for the good of mankind. And if you don't, we're going to murder you because you're in the way of the good of mankind. And so when when you start really looking at the ignorance in the American people right now, I, I, I feel that they're just ready for the same thing all over again. Yes, please take our rights away for the betterment of mankind, please. And the founding fathers were like, no. The people are so stupid. We have to put these protections in place because we know people are dumb and they'll accept this again. You know, if, if we don't put these things written down in a constitution that is over and above public opinion, if public opinion says, hey, we want you to take our rights. Nope, we're a consti- constitutional republic. We have to bend to the constitution. You have to torch the constitution before you can have your majority rule democracy. And people don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see where we're going. It's unfortunate to see where we're going. But, you know, I do kind of wonder if uh, if maybe that's part of God's plan for, you know, you look at China. Where, where is the church growing faster than in China? Right. You know, and it's because of the persecution. Is that what it's going to take for a revival in America is the persecution of the church? Right. Which... It can't happen under our current constitution. Right. No, it can't. And really, I mean, there's just so much corruption right now in government that uh, you, you, everything that you're seeing being held up, freedom and all these values, it's a farce. It's absolutely a farce. People are there not to ensure your freedoms. People are there not there to people are there for their own agenda and it's just a matter of time until it collapses. Russia collapsed. Um, you know, so many things collapsed during our lifetime, um, that you'll eventually see that. And we've seen governments flip flop back and forth, um, in the West as well. We've seen economic collapses, governments declaring bankruptcy. It is a crazy time to be alive right now. I mean, the world that I grew up with is not any longer the world that we know today. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's I crazy. was uh, <clears throat> I was reading an article the other day. Um, this economist was basically going through, and he goes, "Look, we're we're heading towards another downturn." And you know, of course, there's always the doomsayers, and and he was like, "Hey, it's going to be worse than the original Great Depression because of our our debt. Our debt is just <clears throat> insane 
right now as a nation and then as a people. Uh, student loans, you look at that. I mean, it like when I was looking at the numbers that this guy was presenting, it went from like $800 million, uh, I'm sorry, $800 billion seven years ago to $1.5 trillion today. Student yeah. loan debt. That, that's yeah. insane. Right. For... To, to go in debt for something that won't help you get a better job anymore. Like those days are gone. They're right. behind us. And it's just, oh my gosh. I'm like, okay. And with China owning so much of our debt, what happens? And so the guy's point was, we're either going to have massive inflation or the U S is going to have to default on its debt. Yeah. And that's scary because what happens yeah. in the world then? And usually when governments start doing stuff like that, they go, let's go to war. Because right. when we go to war, that changes everybody's, you know, attention and, you know, that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, this turned into a depressing podcast. <laughs> Should we get into a topic? I uh, think we best. I shouldn't have. You can't bring up Kavana. Like, I Is that how we say his name? Kavanaugh? Kavana? I don't know how you say his name. Like, that's how little I, I follow this stuff. Kavana, yeah, I probably butchered it. I don't. I, know I have no I, idea. I don't know. I don't have TV, man. I don't get to hear people say his name sweetly in my ear. I, I actually don't watch news, so yeah, that's probably a good. You know, the stuff I read too. Most of what I what I read in the media is really an op ed piece in the disguise of news. That's the other thing. That's the thing that just gets me. Like, give me facts. Give me news. Don't give me an op-ed piece. Almost everything I read political right now is an op-ed piece in the guise of being facts and news. Yeah. Well, all I got to say to all that is... Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. All right, Doc Brown, kick us off. Great Scott, it's time for this week's topic. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. So what is today's topic? About time. Thank you for saving me, Nacho. And uh, Doc, that was that was. You know, it, it's because you and I don't like to do the doom and gloom. Like we like to we like to have a little fun, and then we get super serious. And now it's like, okay, it can only come up from here now. <laughs> so was that the the round the getting the plane to go? Okay, we're gonna take off now. Ooh, uh, welcome aboard, everybody, to the Church Planner Podcast. My name is Peyton. I'll be your pilot this evening. Um, I'll be taking you up, a little gentle altitude ascent here as we clear the mountains of politics and the economy. Uh, my co-pilot here is Pete Mitchell, and uh, in a minute, uh, Ben's and Barry and uh, Travis will be coming through to look after your needs. If you want some sodas or crackers or pretzels or peanuts, uh, those are complimentary for flying with us today on the Church Planner Podcast. Sit back, buckle your seatbelt, and enjoy the ride. And we'd just like How's to that? remind everybody. The Church Planner Podcast isn't the podcast that planners deserve, but the podcast they need. I'm just saying. And uh, when we hit a bit of turbulence, you'll have to turn on the fasten seatbelt side again, Pete. I wish I had that one. That'd be great. Boom. Ding. <laughs> so, uh, all right. so, so here's the deal, Pete. Um, so this week, I get, a, I get an email. From Refuge in Long Beach. It's from DJ. Remember DJ? Oh, of course. DJ is a guy who was uh, raised in Tanzir, um, has a crazy testimony, very violent background. His parents were, they were saved, right? And didn't they then become missionaries? I know mom, no, I don't know about the missionaries, maybe. I, I know mom got saved uh, like over the phone talking to someone because right. she needed a doctor or something. I can't remember exactly. Had to do with a miracle, right? Something yeah. with his sister? Yeah. yeah. Some, I don't remember who it was, but I remember there was something. She was on the phone and what is this Holy Spirit thing? And, and yeah. So, so if, if I remember correctly, um, she, she was, um, they were doctors, his parents. And so they, they witnessed a miracle and uh, they, they came to faith. Now DJ did not, and uh, but but he was very conscious of God. He had seen these things. And so there was a you know, he believed, but he wasn't following yada, yada. And so he's in refuge uh, Long Beach now. But he walked past when I mentioned something about Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And, you know, there's a quote where he says, maybe when I was doing speedballs, I was looking for God. 
He goes, I don't know. What I do know is there was this black hole in me and yada, yada. And so I'm quoting that as we're preaching. Of course, it's in the open air, and that got his attention. He looked at his wife and said, hey, what's this fool talking about? And he literally came back over because he thought I was going to pray off poor people because that's what he had seen over the years. And he said, you know, so I was coming back, and he said, I was going to have a talk with him and maybe thump him afterwards if he was trying trying to take money from the poor people, because he's like, I looked around at the people that, that were gathered around, and I was like, you know. So anyways, um, he's now uh, one of the leaders at Refuge Long Beach. For the longest time, we had to call him the unleader. It was kind of a secret. He was a leader, uh, most of all a secret to him, because he'd push away from it. But he started a cog, we would call Community Grace, on Saturday mornings on the bluff. And, and it was just a prayer meeting. And people would come to this and like, Last week, somebody, uh, you know, Joseph was there. You know, Joseph from India. He was there and he started talking to a, a, a gentleman. And uh, that guy came Sunday morning. I, I haven't heard if he came to faith yet or what. But, um, but anyways, DJ, um, he texted me in, in the week and he said, Hey, I got a question for you. Can you start a cog or what do you think about starting a cog in a, in a cigar lounge? And I, I, I texted back, I've never been in a cigar lounge. <laughs> you know I, what? He actually took me to his cigar lounge like a month or two ago. Did he really? Yeah. Well, what, what's so funny is I text him back and I say, um, that sounds awesome. In fact, I should pull up the text. But I said, that sounds awesome. Perfect opportunity, man. Natural, boom, boom, boom. And he writes me back after a few minutes and says, good, because it's going awesome right now. <laughs> So he was uh, he was actually in the middle. He's like, I'm having amazing conversations with these guys. So what what I loved about that was that DJ, you know, he started like DJ's always low key about anything he does. Right. He doesn't want any attention. But this brother just literally has just been holding the equivalent of what we would call a cog, which is more like you're having discussions about spiritual things and. In a natural way, but I, I texted him. I said, oh, yeah, we call those missional cogs. And that's something that I never really introduced to Refuge Long Beach. And part of it was, I suppose, each one of their cogs became a core team, and I let them work out how they're going to do ministry in public space. Like, for example, Ruben took it to the projects, and in the center area of the projects where they have the barbecue and whatever, Ruben did church there. And so I was allowing everyone to kind of experiment, but with DJ – This is what I love is the DNA of your people. When you start equipping and activating the gifts of just average everyday believers, I believe, number one, they become leaders. And number two, their DNA is such that they find their own way and they find avenues of mission that are completely original because it's the Holy Spirit working through them in their natural context. So you mentioned that you went to his um, cigar lounge. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. Well, it was funny because um, this is when I was uh, basically meeting Miguel because of the uh, painting he was doing. And uh, so DJ took me to go meet him. We went over to the uh, uh, thrift store that he was working at at the time and he had already asked me, he was like, Hey, do you want to go get a, a cigar afterwards or something like that? And, um, I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, and I think I, I was like, <laughs> I think I was being a little bit, being a little bit me with him before that, because, uh, you know, I, I post every once in a while that, uh, that I enjoy going to the range and, uh, and that's not really his thing. <laughs> like he would, he would make comments back and forth, nothing, nothing, you know, Neither one of us were ever angry at the other or anything like that. So I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll go to the cigar uh, lounge with you if you'll go to the range with me. And he's like, ah, touche, touche, right? So, um, so anyway, after we did that, we went over to the uh, the cigar lounge and um, and he was like, oh yeah, everyone in here, you know, they know me and they know uh, that I'm a Christian and you know just where the conversation goes. But the way a cigar lounge is since you've never been to one it's 
Think of uh, think of think of going to the bar, but there's no alcohol, right? You you go to the bar like you can drink at home. So why do people go to a bar? They go to a bar for the people to talk to other people, um, to meet, to to get to know other people. I mean, you right. you go to a bar for the people. It's very much like in the uh, the UK where you know you've got like this is our pub and you invite another family over to your pub. Um, that's, that's kind of what a cigar lounge is. It's like people just go there, they'll buy a cigar. Some people will take it home, whatever other people, they'll just go grab a seat right there and you just, you meet people and you just talk. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's very cool. I mean, it's a, it's the same reason you would join a book club. Um, it is, except, you know, you're going to be talking Right. A lot, right? I mean, like right. that's what do you what else are you gonna do is you're sitting there with a cigar. You're not just sit, yeah. sitting there like smoking. You're just talking. Well, I love I love the fact there's a couple things now that, that are important to kind of point out here. Number one, people want a focal point. They want an area of commonality. And and this is what people don't understand about mission. Like you could literally join a tabletop gaming society. Like, you know, I've got a little bit of a closet nerd in me. I've never played one of these um, role-playing games, except for when I was a kid. D&D in the 80s was like a big deal. I played that a couple times. But, you know, I, I drove by the other day, in and out near my house, has this gaming store. And I went in it once and showed my daughter, hey, this is all the little stuff. It's cool. But I've never played those as an adult. There's a massive community. If you go in there, they're all excited to see you. Hey, what are you doing? What do you play? What do you, you know, and they come up to you. And, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. So it's, at least I think I'm cool. So I'm like, uh, I don't play these. I just think some of this stuff's kind of neat, you know, and, you know, but if you were to want to reach that group of people, you would get involved. Same with gaming. The most powerful cog or mission outreach I ever saw was was gaming tournaments um, for Halo years ago. And I just think that this is the topic. The topic actually today is harnessing what, what what's called presence for gospel opportunity. Harnessing presence. Just being there. Just literally being there. When I was doing train station um, in Oceanside years ago, right right before I started NAM, I was doing this training called train station. And what I what I did was I gave the guys an assignment to go to a laundromat and do their laundry and just sit there. And nowadays everyone has phones. And so the challenge would be how do you harness presence in a place where you set up a rhythm every week to be there around the same people? That's... That's the key, you know, and, and so what I suggested to the guys when we got into the discussion was I would buy lunch. I would order a pizza and share it every single week, right? I would go around lunchtime and I would make sure everybody knew there's pizza every week if you came at this time and I would buy it and I would make friends and I would talk to people because everybody knows otherwise everyone's going to sit there on their phone the whole time. But if I'm going to go into a neighborhood I want to reach, I'm going to, I'm going to sit at a, you know, in a, in a, in this particular one near us, there's a subway. So I was like, I'd buy a bunch of sandwiches. I get a party platter and I'd order that every week. I wanted them to come up with that, which they didn't. But again, it's part of that thinking strategically for mission. Um, it's this idea of its presence. You don't, you don't have to do a lot. I mean, in a cigar lounge, Pete, I'm guessing that you go there, like you said, you smoke your cigar, and the conversation that happens is just presence, correct? Yeah. You, I mean, sometimes they'll have like a TV in the corner or whatever, but most people aren't sitting there watching the TV. You, something's going to come up. Something's going to say something, and the conversation like, is going to go. How about that Havana? <laughs> Uh, buckle your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. We're hitting a bit of turbulence. Yeah, especially in Long Beach. Can you imagine the conversations that got to go on there? <laughs> Woo! Those yeah, exactly. Fun. But you know, and and so like you know, case in point, um, 
I was talking to a friend of mine, Chris Martinez, who uh, was a guy that I served with for about nine months in Oceanside. We tag teamed his pulpit and he, uh, He's recently moved up to, um, I say recently, but he's moved up to central California. And I was asking him the other day, how's it going? And he goes, it's going amazing. He goes, I, you know, cause he's like, he's a shepherd, but he's the shepherd. So he's perfect balance to me. Could have served with this guy for the rest of my life, but he, <laughs> such a hardcore church planner. He's a shepherd that planted. And in his, on his very first day moving into his neighborhood here in Oceanside, there's a drive-by, like literally a dead body across the street from his house, right? Police are taped off. Someone shot that day. Then in his first year of his church plant, his child gets cancer and dies, oh. his toddler. I, I know. I, I still have a hard time thinking about, you know, what that brother went through as a church planner. Like he, he's an amazing dude. And, but then, you know, he, he stuck it out for years and I came in and I was like, man, this, this guy's awesome, but he's the shepherd where if he's in his office, um, he knows he's not doing his job. So, you know, there's different types of shepherds. There's the shepherds that looked after the, the 99 and then there's a shepherd and Bonomo's this way where you go after the lost. So they kind of look like an evangelist, but it's not an evangelist. It's, there's a, a shepherd that literally he goes out and he finds that lost one and he shepherds him. He shepherds him to Jesus. And Chris and Mike Bonimo are those types of dudes. Paul Percy's that kind of shepherd because he's clearly a shepherd. But there's a reason his his church is called uh, Group 99, right? They're the 99 that are there to go after the one. So, um, you know, so, so here's kind of the deal, right? Um, Chris was, I I was saying, Hey, how are things going? He goes, Oh, amazing. He goes, I'm baptizing seven people, uh, this Sunday, uh, that, that I've been doing outreach with. And I said, really, what what are you doing? He goes, Oh, it's amazing. Peyton. I I can't believe people don't know this. And I said, well, what, what is it? He goes, well, he goes, I'm, I'm, you know how I do that celebrate recovery on Monday nights. I don't lead it, but I'm there. And I said, yeah, definitely. And he said, well, here's the thing. He goes, what I, what I did is I found out a lot of these guys live in group homes. And so he goes, so here's what I do. Every week I go to the group home. I go to various group homes. There's about three of them I go to. And he goes, and here's the thing. It was, it was rhythm and regularity. It was just me being there. He said it started up, you know, probably for the first few months I was just there. Hey, I'm Chris. And I just hang out for 30 minutes, only 30 minutes. And I would take off and I'd have a few little conversations and this and that. But he goes over time. I got to know these guys pretty soon. They're talking to me. Hey, you know, I, I got a daughter. She's mad at me. She won't ever speak to me again. You know, yada, yada. Well, let me pray for you about that. Let's pray for that relationship. Have you done? And he starts kicking into high shepherd mode and he goes, now I'm baptizing seven people this Sunday. From these three group homes. I'm like, are you kidding me? So he's basically created his own chaplaincy for group homes. Interesting. And he said, you know, I I said, where are you like leading a Bible? Because most of us would think, we go to the leader and said, I want to throw a Bible study and no one comes to it. And he goes, no. He goes, I didn't do it that way. He goes, now, the cool thing is a lot of these guys, it counts towards like community service or education or what have you. So he goes... But the way it works is I show up, and if they want to do a Bible study, they ask me, and I'm prepared. He goes, otherwise, I just I just come. I have no agenda. I'm just literally there for them. And again, this is the power of presence, just being there, just being present. And for Chris, that's leading to seven baptisms this week. And that's amazing. That's like a year of sowing and watering. And now he's reaping seven souls that now obviously are going to be reaping more. Cool. So, you know, um, if you were, Pete, tell me a little bit about um, going back to the cigar lounge or, or even the bar. I mean, what's, what's been your experience with not necessarily like throwing a cog in one of these, but what, what's been your experience with opening up these conversations with people? Because I know it's something you've done. You've, you've taken your friends to, 
you know, islands or you well, know, whatever. There's a difference for me though. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the introvert. I'm the shy guy. So I don't, I, if I go to a bar, which ironically, I usually go to one when my son's at church, <laughs> that sounds funny, but it's because I'm waiting for him to get out and I'm, I'm having pizza, pizza and a beer, but I, I'll be the guy that's like reading my iPad. Cause I don't want to talk to people. Cause that's just, I'm, I'm built that way. Right. I don't like talking to people. I don't like talking to strangers. I am literally the exact opposite of you, but. Any of these places you go to, and this is what a lot of pastors, uh, especially Baptist pastors, who um, you know don't go to bars, don't drink because you know maybe their denomination says they don't, or 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 uh, you know they could be in a bad area. Like my dad was in a, a bad area, and you know half the people who went to the church were alcoholics. Maybe three quarters of them were alcoholics, so he didn't want to you know drink, obviously for those those reasons. Um, but for for guys who don't go to to bars what they may not realize is it's the it's one of those places where for the most part everybody's accepted until you do something stupid right mm, but like okay. you can go to a bar and just start talking to people because that's the whole reason they went to the bar like like i said before you can go get a drink anywhere cheaper way cheaper so why do you do it at a bar? Because there's other people there. Maybe you're depressed and you want to drink and you want to talk. But you're not going to say it like that. Right. You're not going to say, I want to go talk to someone. But you go to the bar. That's why the bartenders have those reputations of, of being the guys that everyone can talk to. So why do you think people are at the bar? It's not for the alcohol. It's for the, the community. More than right. anything else. And I'm not saying that's a, a good thing because a lot of those are bad communities. But what I am saying is it's one of those places where you can go and you can talk to people. Right. And it's not right. and it's I, not unusual. It's not weird. And I think that people are maybe a little put off, you know, like some some of the, the maybe our listeners, because they would assume that if you raise the gospel – that you're out, like you're automatically out in those environments, and I I don't find that to be the case. I find if you do what the lot... gospel. I don't understand What's what that? you mean. You said you raise the gospel. I don't know what you mean by that. <clears throat> you raise the gospel as like a topic. Oh, you raise Jesus. You raise the things of God. I don't find that to be the case. I I, think yeah, people... I think one. I think it's how you approach it. Yes. If you're going in there to start preaching to someone who's drinking, you are now not accepted. Right. But if you're going in there having a drink, I mean, is the first line you say to someone, so how about that resurrection? No. I mean, like, that's not where it starts from, but it will. How about that Jesus, huh? Yeah, because here's the thing, though. Like, people <laughs> say, have you heard? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Has someone told you the four spiritual laws? I mean, that's not where you're starting. Pull out your pocket. <laughs> That's not where the conversation starts from. But you know this. You can take a conversation to there easily. Right. Because when people start talking, they're talking about the good stuff, but then they also, everyone talks about a struggle, something bad. Every right. single person. It's just for right. some people, it's worse. And it's their focal point. And that's where you can swoop in and start diverting the conversation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, like you said, it's kind of like if you saw that Chris Pratt video that I posted um, yesterday uh, on Facebook, uh, you can go to my wall and check it out. But Chris Pratt basically talked about what it's like to be a Christian who talks about Jesus in Hollywood. And he said, you know, people have this idea that Hollywood is very anti-God. And he said, really, I don't find that. He goes, I find they're not anti anything in Hollywood. They're kind of like pro everything. And that's that's where Christians get into trouble. Is we come off as anti something. We look like Neanderthals. He says, no, they're open. If you're authentic and, you know, you're not a jerk about it, people are, are very curious. And so here's a guy rubbing elbows with a Hollywood elite saying they're honest and they respect the authenticity. 
of his faith. And I, I have definitely found that with people, you know, who like I, my dad lived in Hollywood and I knew some people in Hollywood and there was definitely not like any of the A-listers or anything like that, but there was definitely an openness and there's actually more faith kicking around there. And, and the same with people, you know, 30% of San Diego County is Catholic. I would have never known that. Right. Um, the amount of people, uh, that, that are evangelical, uh, that figure jumped. It doubled in the last 10 years in San Diego County. I wouldn't have known that. Obviously there is gospel work going on. And what I, what I found in that, that could be nominal Christianity, whatever. But the point is the underlying background and assumptions that people make are still largely based around the context of a Judeo Christian worldview. And so you will meet the, the local vocal who says, no, you know, I, that God crap and all that. And that's usually the person that's going to be the one that has the deepest experience and is the most, believe it or not, um, likely to become a Christian. Um, it's usually the very emotional person. Um, they've got more of an, an emotional reason than they do um, uh, an intellectual one. So, uh, you know, I would say just keep, keep, you know, find your zone, find the spot that's your rhythm. This is what I love about, um, I've talked about some ways you can intentionally go somewhere and be present, but what about the places you're already present? Um, I was with my boss last week in Denver and his wife, her recent motto has been to add value wherever she goes in, in, in the name of Christ. And she doesn't know what that's going to look like. And I love that idea that everywhere you go, you're looking at people thinking, how do I add some God given value to you? It may be that I just help you. So maybe that I give you a smile. It may be that I buy your drink for you. It may be there's some way it's maybe that I encourage you as a barista for, Hey, you made a good drink. It's something everywhere she goes. She's saying, I want to be someone who adds value to everyone around me, which is rad, right? Like that's how a gospel worker, that's how a missionary thinks, right? Of course, you're thinking in the context of the gospel, but you're thinking sowing, watering, and reaping. You're not going into every situation saying, I'm going to reap today. You're going in saying, I'm going to start by sowing. That's what she's saying. She's, she's kind of entering into that slipstream of being a channel for the heart of God wherever she goes. Right. Because the heart of God everywhere we go is to bless. That's why Jesus opens up the um, Beatitudes, 400 years of silence. Matthew's gospel opens up with the first red letter words being blessed is or blessed are. Because God's heart, when he first creates mankind, is to bless. Right. He he wants to bless. you. So it says he blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply. Make more of yourselves. He blessed them. Everything that, that he has to do with mankind, his heart is always to bless. He blesses Noah after the flood. He blesses Abraham, and I will bless you and your descendants, and they will become a blessing and bless the world. And, of course, he's talking about Jesus. So the heart of God is to bless humanity. That has always been to save it, yes, um, now, but that is the way he has restored his intention of blessing humanity, not cursing it. Although cursing is definitely found in the Bible and people will be cursed for all eternity, but that is not God's heart. So when you embody that attitude, what she's saying is, I want to be a blessing. I want to be a channel of God to everyone around me. And so this idea of presence is that place that you go is actually blessed simply because you are there. And so what I would say is a couple things. Number one, find the place where you already have presence and seek to be a blessing there. And then number two, um, make sure that if you go to something like a bar, you don't go by yourself. So we've talked about maybe going to a bar. Go with a partner. Go with a wingman. I would not ever recommend that somebody go to a bar on their own. That is very dangerous as a Christian. Keep Why in do mind you say spiritual that? Warfare. Keep in mind spiritual warfare. Um, for, for church planners out there, Spiritual warfare is not something to be joked with. Um, I remember talking to Daniel Fusco 
um, years ago about being a church planner in San Francisco. And he said, we had a rule and that was never going to the city alone. That city eats up Christians and pastors for breakfast. And it's not, it's not like the, the homosexual thing. It was just, it was a dangerous place. And if you, if you go into dark areas looking to, um, you know, make a difference, your things are going to happen. Like you're going to get hit on or, you know, Satan will, will exploit any weakness. That's why Jesus sent people out in two by twos. And so I would say if you're intentionally looking to go on mission, you always take someone with you. Um, Paul didn't go alone. You know, Jesus didn't send him out alone. Um, so you do that. And then number three, uh, the most important thing is pray. We talked about those, um, those, uh, opportunities coming up. Um, but you pray. Because you're asking for God to, to bring those things that are below the surface. Um, there may have been a conversation. Someone might have prayed for the first time in years the night before. And here you stumble in and you're just being present in that cigar lounge and you become the answer to the, those prayers that they prayed. I've had that happen. Um, where someone just breaks down. I think I've told the story a number of times about the guy at, at Staples who just broke down. I was there to buy a, believe it or not, a, a paperclip holder when I was a missionary in Wales. And I opened up a conversation with this guy on the, in the checkout line and he broke down in tears, big dude, um, broke down in tears saying he had prayed last night, God, if you're there, please send me a sign. Let me know. I am desperate. And so he's, he's, he's crying in the, in, in staples. And I was able to hook him up with uh, refuge so he could get some help. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it, you just never know, but you got to be in prayer asking the Lord to open these doors. Well, guys, um, thanks for joining us today for the podcast. Uh, we'll be making our descent now into, uh, another advertisement. <laughs> you got to put on your best pilot uh, voice. Uh, yeah. We're please, uh, fold up your tray tables and put your seat in the forward position once again. And the stewardess will be coming around. Pete to check that you're ready for our next advertisement. <laughs> well, what I really want to know is if I'm at the bar all the time or the cigar lounge, <laughs> but I've got all these other tasks I have to do for my church, how do I do it? Well, you need to call Simplify Church, Pete. Um, SimplifyChurch.com is a company that dedicates itself to helping church planters. What they do is they do your uh, payroll needs, they'll take care of your bookkeeping, they'll take care of your IRS compliancy, and just about anything else you need. They'll even provide you with a virtual assistant, should that be what you require, Pete. Well, my real question is, will they help me understand this whole Brett Kavanaugh thing? Because that's, that's what I need guidance on. Pete, all you need to do is go to SimplifyChurch.com, and they'll walk you through all of the ins and outs of the Kavana <laughs> case. And just about anything else you want to know. If you want to know where babies came from, whether or not the earth is flat, head on over to SimplifyChurch.com, and they'll take care of all of your needs. People don't actually think the earth is round, do they? <laughs> that's funny. Um, Steve-O does from Jackass, and dang it, that's a good enough for me. Steve-O showed me. Like that was it. all the scientific proof I needed, Pete. There you go. And by the way, I am a round earther, just in case you're getting scared here. So, uh, and the moon's the a satellite. Totally space... The What's moon's that? a satellite. The moon's a satellite. Everybody knows it's a hollow space station. That's where the reptilians live. So, hey, thanks for joining us for the Church Planner podcast today, reminding you that if you want to reach the ones no one's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. This is Pete Mitchell. This is Nigel calling for Pete Mitchell. Pete, it's Nigel. Please call me back. It's important that I speak with you, Pete. And we managed to get through an entire podcast this time without ripping on the English once. <laughs> I'm leaving that. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. 
If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Music